And a very good evening to you. Thank you for joining us and welcome to a special look north coming live from the crumbling cliffs of the east coast. Tonight, living on the edge. What happens when coastal erosion takes away your home? Not a word I can put to it, except uh, heartbreaking, which is a word I don't really like. Sacrifice to the sea, how flooding parts of our coast could save us all from rising sea levels. And we're live in a helicopter with this crumbling coast to get a unique look at what the future holds for this fragile environment. You were lucky it dried up just in time. What did I say on Friday? Cloudy, wet and windy. Another successful yeah, forecast. Whatever. I'll be back, of course, with a detailed five-day forecast and I'll be taking a look at what rising sea levels mean to our East Coast. Join us both in a few moments. And a very good evening to you. Thank you for joining us and welcome to tonight's programme. We are live at the home of Colin and Josie Arnold. They live at Olrome on the East Coast. Now, they bought this house because of its fabulous view. But let me just show you. This is actually the kitchen, or was the kitchen. They've had to move out and dismantle the house brick by brick. We're at Old Rome, nine miles to Bridlington, six miles to Hornsey down there. Now, this here is the living room. And if you look over here, that is the beach and the sea. It is frightening. That's what coastal erosion has done, and that's what we're going to be talking about on the programme tonight. And I'll be chatting with the Arnolds, Josie and Colin, in just a bit. But also tonight, we have got a helicopter right up there in the sky. Matt Richards is on board there for some live pictures and hopefully explain to us exactly what has caused the Arnolds house to be falling into the sea. Matt. Well, thanks, Peter. You can see... This is a fantastic evening to be flying about on a helicopter like this. Now, as we know, the East Yorkshire coast is one of the fastest eroding coastlines in Europe. 1.8 metres a year. It's a complicated process, but you can see the dominant wave coming from the northeast. Now, these are attacking the base of the cliffs, and you can see down there the brown colour. That's the uh, that's the mud that makes up these cliffs that's being washed away. Now, you hear that the happen evenly. It looks like big bites have been taken out of the cliff and that's where the landslide And it was one of those landslides just before Easter that finally sealed the fate for Josie and Colonel's home that we can see below us now. Here's their story. They're demolishing their home brick by brick. But how did Josephine and Colin Arnold's dream retreat by the sea turn into this, an eroding nightmare? I've spent the last few months following this couple who've been, quite literally, living on the edge. They did have a lot of character, it was lovely. And all the family used to come every weekend and we'd have dinner all together and that, and it was smashing. The field, we had tents on and camper vans, and we opened a little restaurant in the barn. That was 19 years ago, but ever since then, the sea and the cliff edge have been getting closer. It just disintegrated rapidly. After five years, the camping field was useless. You couldn't turn a car around on it anymore. The Arnolds say the erosion here has been accelerated because of private sea defences either side of their home, but it still looked like they had a few years left. That was until this night in March. Colin filmed the moment a storm took 10 feet off the cliff and left their home hanging over the edge. It was quite frightening, really, because it was coming right over the top of the bungalow that we're in. And there was bricks and rubble and boulders on top of that as well. It went right over onto the road. It was the final straw. The house had to come down before nature dragged it all onto the beach. Not a word I can put to it, except uh, heartbreaking, which is a word I don't really like. Get rid of all this brickwork. Hopefully. It will resemble something again, but it's going to be difficult. I just think of all the happy times we had here. Yes. I just try not to think about it at all. It's taken them six weeks of non-stop effort to demolish this home, all of it having to be done by hand, as the cliff top makes it too dangerous for any machinery. Cobbles that way, bricks that way. Every time I visited, it was clear exhaustion was taking its toll. 
I'm about done for. <laughs> but tomorrow will be the last one. This will go. And that'll be it. Nothing else to knock down. Just tidy up. That'll be good. That'll be good. So Cliff Farm may have been demolished, but Josie and Colin aren't moving. They're determined to stay in their caravan, and their old home has become their garden. We've left the front of the house there. We even locked the door at night. And that's because if this is a nightmare, one day I'll open that door and it'll all be back as it was. <laughs> the place has completely changed. It'll never, obviously, never be the same again. But we'll try and make the best of what we've got. Well, as far as this place is concerned, uh, it's all in the hands of that lot out there. Well, it is an extraordinary story. We're live here at All Rome tonight, and Colin and Josie are with me now. Um, we heard there in that film, you're determined not to go. No, we're not going to go anywhere, no. No, we're going to stay here. As long as there's enough room for a motor home, we'll stay here. Has the whole thing been really traumatic and upsetting? Because to see the house like that, and, you know, I've just walked in there. I mean, you were living in it, you know, a while back, and now, yeah, you know, it's just... Just seven weeks ago we were living in it. It's just, uh, well, it's heartbreaking. You're literally taking the place to pieces. So upsetting, though, to sit and watch your home actually disappearing, you know, week by week. Yes, yes. We expected it to go at some time, but not yet. And I gather that when you're in the house, when you were in this house before you had to move out, sometimes when the sea would bash the wall here, the whole house would shake. Yeah, when it bounces off the sea defences to the north of us, the house just jumped and it cracked it so badly, which was one of the reasons we had to take it down. I mean, I'm not being funny, but how, when you're in that bedroom up there, right on, right on the edge of this lot, how yeah. do you sleep? You just do, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think nice. I would. Yeah, you would. Do you think so? <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of people would like to live here. You know, it's it's, it's a fabulous spot, though, yeah. isn't it? What about those people? And there are people who say, well, you know, these people who buy their house on the cliff edge, they know that it's, it, it, you know, it's going to fall into the sea. Yes, yes, we knew when we bought it. It was a house on a naturally eroding cliff, and bad sea defences built on both sides of us. So it's exaggerated the problem. And all these sea defences they talked about, I mean, 20 years ago, they were talking about a rubber ledge down here, weren't they, to stop the sea coming in? Nothing has been done? No, nothing has been done, no, no. I mean, you, you can't build sea defences unless you're going to build them all the way down the coast. You can't do this to people, you know, it's just, it's not fair. OK, yeah. well, stay with us for a bit, because we're going to be talking to a minister in a moment to find out about the subject of uh, compensation. Josie, come in for the moment. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for being there. Let's go back now to the helicopter in the sky, to Matt, to uh, find out what he's up to right now, because it's not just the Arnold who are at risk. Matt? Well, at all, Peter, now, uh, from here, we can get a very clear look at the caravan parks that, uh, that line the way along here. Anything easier for them, they can do a rollback, that means they can, put simply it means I suppose they can move the caravans away from the sea, but of course you can't do that with a house. Now there was a recent report, and it's quite clear here, just at the top of your picture now, you can see some more homes that are in a similar position. So along this Holderness coast, from Flamborough in the north down to Spurn in the south, they found that over the next 50 years, almost six families will be in the same position as Josie and in a minute. Back to you, Peter. Thanks very much indeed. Well, there we are. It's not just coastal erosion as well, it's sea levels rising, particularly around the Humber and around Lincolnshire. It's a big problem, isn't it, Paul? It is, and this part of the world is particularly vulnerable. You'll see in the film that I made last week uh, that we've got a natural rebound of the seabed, which is naturally causing sea levels to rise, plus we've got the impact of man-made climate change as well. And this part of the coastline, the Lincolnshire coastline and the Humber is uh, right in the firing line. OK, well, you made this film and I have to say you had better weather last Thursday than we've had today, but uh, have a look at this. It's getting hotter and the signs are everywhere. Global warming is happening. The only debate is the extent to which man is to blame, but there's no argument at all about what it all means. According to scientists, sea levels here on the Humber are already on the rise. As the earth warms up, so does the water, and that causes a thermal expansion. And as you can see, the sea rises 
and there's nowhere for the water to go. And when you add in the impact of the melting of the polar ice caps, you can see that it's going to be a very serious problem indeed. And one that will affect millions. A third of us live within 10 kilometres of the coast. It's estimated that every year the sea is rising by about six millimetres. And by the end of the century, we're looking at increases of anything up to a metre. Here at the deep, they've got a rising sea level simulator. And as I turn this wheel, it gives an idea of just how vulnerable this part of the world is to rising sea levels in a relatively short space of time. And what we're talking about here is a real risk of devastating sea floods, like those which killed 307 people on the east coast in 1953. This area is vulnerable because this goes back to our geological history. This area is it's low lying, but at the same time, it's sinking. Because of the last ice age, Scotland is coming up, the east of England and southeast of England is, is sinking. So that combined with sea level rise means we get doubly hit. We get the sea levels coming up, the land going down. We're on our way now to Reeds Island in the Humber to see how climate change is already affecting the natural environment. Last year, 200 pairs of avocets nested here, but not anymore. Changes to the level of the Humber have helped push out one of Britain's rarest birds. There's been some quite major changes, really. The lagoon walls and all the edge of the, 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 the site have just washed away. And then, of course, we'd have been standing in a deep water lagoon here and that's just disappeared. In the future, the whole island will disappear. No one knows what else will be lost with it. The changes are going to be so massive as that no one's really sure at all how we're going to cope. We can try and create new habitats for the birds, but we're not quite sure whether they'll use them, the same birds will use them, or whether the birds will be there at all to use them. Such uncertainty has called for a brand new approach. Where once we built sea defences to keep the water out, now the scientists tell us that in some places we have to welcome it in. We're following a new approach now called making space for water, uh, allowing the, the rivers and the estuaries to spread out over areas that were formerly defended to try to counteract the effects of sea level rise. This is what's happened here at Paul Home Strays and on an even greater scale at Olgborough. The total cost has been more than £17 million. Schemes like this are now the preferred policy. This is a great solution to sea level rise. It, it's a win-win-win situation. By having this here, we've got somewhere for the water to go, so we don't have to build the dikes as high. It's a win on public safety, so hull doesn't flood. Third of a million people getting wet, so that's the second win. And then third win, as you can see around here, it's a win for wildlife. Keeping a static coastline is not a battle that can be won because the coast has always changed. The main challenge we face is to manage rising sea levels in a way that suits wildlife and man alike. And of course, Paul will have the full forecast uh, live from here at Oro in just a few minutes' time. Well, the problem of rising sea levels, let's turn to, to Lincolnshire, and there, of course, they have rising sea level problems as well. To make it even more complicated, there, the land, the farming land, the agricultural land is so good. Hannah Moffat can explain this story. 300 years ago, this is how the Fenlands looked, waterlogged and unusable. But draining this area has turned it into some of the most valuable agricultural land in the country. In Roman times, the, the sea would have about come up to that hedge. So this would have been um, really on the edge of the sea, um, silty dunes that have created this wonderful soil today. Well, this, this is a very fertile area that, um, uh, that supplies about approximately 40% of the, the, the food for this country. Tony Gent and Robert Codwell are Fenland farmers working top grade land to produce wheat, rapeseed oil and a variety of vegetables. For years they've relied on these drainage pumps to make sure their land stays dry. But for them and many other lowland farmers, the future isn't as cut and dry. Global warming poses a real threat. I think sea level rise is one of the most important things that farmers have to concern themselves, especially when they're farming, as we are, right on the frontage of the coast. Even for those farming 15 miles from the sea, the threat is still concerning. Water also comes down the river, so it can ingress in land quite a long way. The battle between sea and land is very real for Fenland farmers. The problems may not be imminent, 
but the risks aren't worth taking. It's not something that I think in the next couple of decades that we need to be taking panic action, but we do need to plan now and make sure that we've got a sustainable future, that we don't start to think about it in 20 or 30 years' time. We have to start thinking about it now. Hannah Moffat reporting there from Lincolnshire on the problems down there with the land and the sea levels. Well, joining me now is the Minister for the Environment and Climate Change, Ian Pearson. Um, Ian, can you tell me why can't these people, I mean, it is an act of nature, why can't they have some sort of compensation? Well, the policy of successive governments over the years has been that there's no right to compensation. So this would be a completely new and novel departure. Now, East Riding Council have asked you specifically to look at the subject of compensation. Can I ask you tonight, will you do that? Well, I've said that I'm happy to meet the, the local Member of Parliament and uh, delegation from uh, the local authority about this. Um, but, as I say, uh, we really face a situation where, when you look at the East Riding coast, um, we've funded sea defences in areas like Withensea very recently. But we can't put up concrete walls right around the United Kingdom. That doesn't make sense. We've got some work going on I looking at uh, different...